in-house teams, that's when you tend to look outside to specialized boutique vendors, specialized boutique consulting companies uh, like Optimity Advisors that I'm a partner with, like Caserta Concepts that I'm a good friend with uh, Joe uh, over there. And so when you're taking a look at building out the elastic technology infrastructure that can scale up for your needs or scale down uh, for lower volume and save you money on those times that it's scaling down, uh, you know, I recommend people like Joe. And I've got an audio clip here, for instance, of uh, what Joe is doing in terms of talking about uh, the data industry, uh, as well as kind of what organizations are evolving towards, you know, similar to the role that I have at RMT. I'm a chief analytics officer at RMT, so I'm looking at the data, the underlying insights that can drive content discovery. Uh, but uh, it's about the insights. It's about the business outcome. It's not about the technology itself. Uh, similarly, organizations are going through this evolution of understanding that data is an asset uh, I am an advocate of data actually being on your financial statements. There's so many people out there that say data is the new oil. Uh, if, if you had oil in a company, that certainly would be on your financial asset. Your first party data is gold. And uh, the secret here is figuring out how to dig out that gold, discover it. But there be gold in them hills, as they say. Uh, it's time to get a shovel. Uh, so a lot of organizations, uh, particularly those that are heavily regulated, like those in the financial space or in the healthcare industry, uh, really have a focus first and foremost on data governance, uh, really making sure that the stewards and the owners of the data are identified, that there are data cleansing processes in place to ensure quality, uh, that your data lineage is in place and you know where that data is coming from and how it's being transformed along the way so that when you look at that dashboard as a, as a C-level executive, uh, you can point at an attribute and know where that data came from and ensure that it was and have confidence that it was of high quality uh, that gets into data lineage and data quality. Well, one of the best out there, and I've seen him speak several times at many, many conferences, and he recently spoke at uh, MIT, uh, is a guy named Joe Caserta. He's the founder of a company called Caserta Concepts. And I've got an audio clip here of him talking about the emerging role of his chief data officer, uh, which is not that dissimilar from a chief analytics officer like I am at RMT. So here's a little bit of a blurb about uh, Joe Caserta talking about data organizations at MIT this past year. In the previous session from uh, the Department of Transportation, we asked him to define his, his role. Uh, he has one definition of it. Are you f defining any commonality or any similarity of definition to the CDO role? Um, so I've been in uh, the data space for 30 years now, and I've seen the evolution of data over, the, over that time span. And the CDO is a fairly new role, uh, but in the past couple of years, I've seen it have its own life evolution life cycle. Uh, it started off being purely data governance, uh, but now um, we're seeing that it's also um, embracing uh, trying to help monetize your data and also help do the analytics portion of your data. Um, and then there is some aspect of like a divide and conquer where you have a CDO organization that will have maybe a chief analytics officer, a chief data governance officer, and then you know that collection of, of people will be a new division within an organization from the executive leadership level down, um, because data is becoming so much so critical within an organization. It's no longer just a backroom collection of data. It's actually becoming a way of doing business. Now we just have. And this is so true. And uh, I, I, I go to these meetups uh, in New York City. If you ever uh, heard of the organization called meetup.com, they sponsor, they sponsor one here in New York City called uh, Data Driven New York City. And uh, when Strata plus Hadoop was uh, in town at the Javits Center, uh, they had really amazing speakers in town, all these core data scientists from uh, some of the biggest companies, whether it was Airbnb uh, or whether it was uh, Uber. You know, Uber, I had a chance to see inside the engine of that, and the analytics that they use to drive that is just incredible. And, uh, you know, those are businesses that couldn't exist without this analytics infrastructure. Uh, and yet, Yet so many of the media companies out there don't have this yet uh, and are being uh, kind of approached by these threats in the industry of these kind of, uh, I'll call them data, um, 
uh, data native uh, companies or analytics native companies, people that are kind of born uh, in this this sphere. Uh, yet you've got the media industry that needs to transform over to this and is just really digging in over the past two years or so, uh, really discovering the power of data, the same type of power that drives entire business models like Uber, like Netflix, uh, you know, can really uh, bring amazing value to the media industry today. So that that is the uh, the, the the fourth uh, thing here. Uh, the fourth part of supply chain of insights is to ensure an elastic technology infrastructure exists to support big data storage and analysis. Number five is to acquire and land those data sets and have data scientists test and learn, test and learn, test and learn, spawning insights. Number six, as insights turn into patterns. So these data scientists have discovered uh, this light bulb. Uh, the light bulb has just gone off and they, they've said, hey, here it is, Eureka, I found it, I've discovered the gold. And now suddenly the senior executives are saying, okay, give that to me every day. Well, the data scientist doesn't want to create that thing over and over, right? This is where you really want automation to come into play. Uh, so as part of number six, as insights turn into patterns, establish processes to promote them out of the data scientist's hands and turn them into business as usual automated thingamajigs. And that word thingamajig, it's an official, <laughs> it's an official term. So number seven uh, is now deploying insights via technology systems to business stakeholders and management. And so these insights have now become the business, but businesses need to be nimble. And one of the things that's so important in, in terms of uh, being nimble is to be able to creatively destroy your business as usual processes and technology systems as the environment changes. And the environment has never changed faster than it's changing today, uh, which gets into the need to, in number nine, repeat steps one through eight. You need to set up agile uh, processes within your organization. You need to think in terms of iterations and iterative delivery and microservices and just getting the, the next features out the door, responding to what consumers are doing with those next features or next uh, shows or whatever it happens to be. And so you want to repeat steps one through eight with uh, really strong agile frameworks. There are so many amazing tools out there that are uh, there to support uh, this agile mentality. Uh, the one that I, or the, the, the agile framework that I tend to, to, to like most is Scrum though there are plenty of others. Uh, I grew out of a background of using the unified process, for, uh, the, the rational unified process, uh, before I took on Scrum. Uh, before that uh, was also something called extreme programming back when I was on the software side. But Agile has really moved out of the technology sphere and into just becoming business as usual. So if you haven't picked up a book on Agile methodologies yet, I highly recommend it. And you can send me an email if you'd like to get some suggestions on which books are out there. I've got a few that I like in particular. Again, my email is nate.rakowitz at nathanielmedia.com. So step number 10 is, well, now you've got the agile processes in place. You can now become an enlightened organization. So that is the supply chain of insights at a very high level. Obviously, there is so much depth and experience that's needed, uh, vendors that are out there to kind of piece together the solutions here. But really, I am a huge advocate of becoming an agile organization. Again, I've got great books on this. Uh, becoming an agile organization, uh, identifying those uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that are out there, establishing the data sets that may exist, making sure your technology infrastructure is in place uh, with the guys like Joe Caserta uh, to get these things set up, getting that data in-house, making sure your data scientists are uh, really empowered with the right tools, the right data, that it's of a high-quality standard in terms of data governance, data quality, et cetera. The ability to get it out of the data scientist's hands, though, into business as usual, though, is one of the most difficult things that I've seen. And uh, the big companies that are, uh, I'll call them data natives again, the data natives uh, do this very well. It's just part of what they do. They put a data scientist next to the software engineers. Uh, they work hand in hand and are able to kind of cross help each other, take one thing from the data science space, move it into the data engineering space, get it off the lap of the data scientist so that the data scientist can go searching for that new gold, searching for that new oil, searching for that new insight. So that is the supply chain of insights. I'm happy to talk with you more about that. We'll be talking about various aspects of that on future episodes of Insight.media. Uh, but uh, we're taking this kind of mentality and bringing it to RMT right now. 
So as their chief analytics officer at RMT, I'm focused on agile development practices. I'm focusing on the underlying data, first party data, second party data, and third party data, how that informs content analytics, how that informs the DNA of a television show, how that informs the ability for a consumer to be given the proper recommendations for what they're really interested in, because the industry has not done a great job of that to date. Uh, RMT has some wonderful recommendation services in this space that are 30% better than the best thing on the market. Uh, And so I certainly encourage you, if you are in the television space or if you're in the advertising space, go check out www.rmt.solutions or send me an email at nate.rackwoods at nathanielmedia.com. I'd love to talk with you more about the analytics that that underlie content creation, content discovery, uh, and advertising placement accordingly. So that is our show for today, but I want to share with you one more cool thing that's going to be coming out from RMT this week. Uh, It's something we call Delighter, and there's an alpha version of that that will be out shortly. And here's one of the co-founders of RMT talking about the consumer version of this uh, as an app. So hopefully you, your screen can see my screen. And this is Bill this Harvey. This is the Delighter app. So you tap it, and it, it comes up. And then you, you can specify, oh, I just want to see Jack Nicholson or whatever, but typically they're just going to say recommend. And then it comes right up. So these are the top ten shows for me, based on my driver tags, that I could watch right now. And you can scroll down to you know to see all ten of them, and if if you're really a fanatic, you can even press a button and you can keep scrolling and see all of the shows in in the order in which they rank based on the uh, their driver tags and the, what I like to watch on television. And then for any one of these, you can um, you can hit this thing to see a text description, or uh, you can hit this thing to see a trailer. Can you remember what it's like to be inside your mother's womb? To see what the show is like, and then... Uh, have you ever thought about why people have to age? If you want to watch it now, then you get where it's available and how much it costs, or if you can watch it for free. And then you, you hit that and you go, you're taken to, to see the content. So, so that's, that's basically the... So it's really easy to use and quick. And... Um, you know, uh, what we found back in 1997 is that people said, this thing gets me. It didn't take long. It just understands what I like on television. Now. Wow, how does it work? It's some kind of an artificial intelligence in there, isn't it? Well, it is some kind of an artificial intelligence. It's based on a ton of deep learning techniques, really interesting stuff uh, and uh, really cutting edge stuff, uh, leveraging deep learning uh, techniques, uh, which are part of artificial intelligence, uh, getting into machine learning, which is uh, something you can do once you've got a good data and analytics platform in place. Once you've got uh, your methodologies in place, once you're a finely tuned engine that's running with the proper agile frameworks uh, and built on a supply chain of insights. Find out more at NathanielMedia.com. I'm your host, Nate Rakowitz, and uh, this is Insights.media. I invite you to share the show with a friend or send me an email. Uh, I certainly appreciate you guys listening.